Okay, let's get started. A lot to cover today. So I, I combined two lectures from last year into one, <laughs> and it's web scraping, scraping and messy data. All right, just quick announcements. Final project is uh, the part one is due tomorrow. Most, more importantly, there was a rubric posted um, because the, the requirements I had originally posted were like um, the expected standard for everyone, but then last year I did give extra credit to people if they went above and beyond, and I wanted to make that clear ahead of time to people so that they weren't disappointed that they missed an opportunity to get more points. So anyway, um, that's now listed in the part one description, uh, so it's not a surprise. Uh, and homework five is due Friday. And again, remember to test out that you can connect to the database first uh, so you don't get surprised later. Questions? Okay. All right, so last time we kind of went through what I called a data safari, which is like looking at a lot of different data in the wild. And we saw that like CSV files are common, but not the only way to get data. We saw some data APIs. Um, sometimes data was distributed as a SQLite database. Um, and so on, yeah. But today uh, we're gonna be getting data in a different way. Uh, specifically with web scraping, uh, first of all, which is sometimes called crawling, I guess. Um, so th this is the case, uh, this is useful when you have data that's hosted by someone on a website that's it's intended for people to read. Uh, they don't have a data API for you to get data programmatically, but you still wanna get all that data by like somehow writing a program that clicks through all the different pages on the website and copies down all the data to a file or something for uh, access later. Um, the term crawling is used to describe like when search engines do this. Like for example, the way Google works, the way that they know what different sites have content relevant to your search is that Google has servers that like crawl through the web. So they visit as many websites as they can and kind of like download the contents of the websites and store the text that's on those different websites so that later on, if you search for something, it, it knows what pages have that content because it's visited them before and it has remembered and recorded and stored in some kind of database what's on those web pages. Um, yeah. So we're gonna do something similar except for a, a more limited type of, of um, application. So specifically, if there's a data set online, you want to turn it, you want to get all the data that's on those various web pages and use it to do an analysis. Does that problem definition make sense to you all? You understand what I mean? I'll show some examples also. That'll make it more clear. Um, I want to give a warning. So notice this is in red. <laughs> uh, you should be, sometimes data scraping can get you in trouble. If you, uh, if a website has some kinds of terms of service, which is a you know, contract that defines what they allow you to do. Um, you might think that the internet is like the wild, wild west and you can do whatever you want and there aren't consequences necessarily, but that's not always true. If you violate, uh, so okay, for example, on, on Facebook, if you write a program that goes through and like copies down all the data that, you, that it encounters on Facebook, um, Facebook will detect that and cancel your account. Okay, that, that, that might be inconvenient. But even worse, uh, LinkedIn uh, has actually sued about 100 different people for scraping data off of their website because the value, like the, if, if they were to allow people to copy link, LinkedIn, if LinkedIn was, were to allow people to copy their data, their business would be in trouble because the, the whole value of their uh, service is the, the network that they have stored, right? And they, pay, they charge uh, subscribers a monthly fee to get all that have access to more data throughout LinkedIn, right? And that business model would be compromised if uh, others could, could access it elsewhere. So if it seems like you're stealing data that, that is being sold by that, the company elsewhere, then you're, you're probably, you're gonna get in trouble if they catch you doing that. And the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, <laughs> which is like, can put you in prison for hacking basically, that applies even if you're like getting data off of public pages. Even if you're not breaking into a computer, you can still go to prison for hacking. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, so, um, so you can use this for uh, data that seems to be uh, open to the public, 
but the provider has neglected to provide an API to make that, that access available programmatically, yet somehow it seems like they wouldn't mind if you were to download their data. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? There's, there's an article here with more details about the legal. A lot of the legal aspects of this are not fully hashed out yet because the courts haven't really figured out how to consistently apply the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, but I've done this <laughs> quite quite a lot before for uh, various things. You just kind of can tell when it when it seems right and when it seems wrong. <laughs> okay, so let's start with a uh, a case that you know no, where no harm is definitely done um, on the McCormick web pages for course listings. Right there, each department has a page. Like here's the computer science uh, website uh, under the courses link. There's a list of all of our courses. And if you, there's, so there's this one index page, and if you click any one of these, there's some details in another page, right? So somehow this is, um, if we wanted to do some kind of analysis or store this data for some purpose, we might want to scrape this website, which would involve like visiting this index page, copying down some of this information, and then also using what we find here, like essentially clicking these links programmatically to download some detail pages to get more information to supplement what we found in the index. Okay, that's the general goal here. Uh, yeah. So when we look at that index page, so remember that web pages um, maybe remember is the wrong word, but realize that web pages are documents, HTML documents that are interpreted by the browser. In, uh, they have some specification that determines how to make things appear the way they do. And uh, th what, a, what a web browser does is download an HTML document and interpret it to render it in some graphical way. What your program is going to do is download the same HTML document, but instead of presenting it to a screen, it's going to uh, pick out pieces of that data and save them somewhere for your own nefarious purposes. right? Um, but uh, so on this index page, for example, what we're interested in is all these rows that list different courses, and this this one highlighted here for CompSci 211 has uh, has a course number listed, has a course title, and it also, even though you don't see it, it has inside this link the URL, which is to say the web address, where you can get more information, right? So. What we'd want to do is write a computer program that can download this HTML page and then interpret it to find all these pieces of information. And then later on, we'll, probe, we'll take all those URLs and run them through a different scraper to get the details. Okay, Questions? All right, so here's the detail page. So on this page, Again, we want to write a program that downloads this page, the HTML for this page, which is, again, that HTML is being rendered in a nice graphical way by the browser, but it also is just a bunch of code that can be interpreted by a program. And in that code, you can find, what we want to find is the uh, quarters offered, this, this bit here. We want to find the prerequisites, and we want to find the description. Because this information was not available on the main page. We had to dive into the detail page to get that. And we want to do that for every single course. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so that seems like a pretty um, reasonable task that's well defined. So to do this, um, I, I have this code that's actually available. You can look at it now if you want and follow along. Uh, it's uh, on GitHub slash start slash web scraping examples, and uh, you can cl click through it on the slides if you also. And it uses Python. It uses a couple of libraries. Uh, the request library is a Python package that you can use to uh, fetch web pages. So basically, you give it a URL, just like you give a browser a URL. But instead of like showing the contents on the screen, it just downloads the HTML and saves it to a Python variable. And then you, then you have all this HTML code that you can um, parse to get the, the pieces that you want. And the second library is does that parsing I mentioned. Beautiful soup, in this case, beautiful soup four, is a Python package that is capable of of interpreting HTML documents. And so that stuff that that data that you download can be fed into this beautiful soup package, and then we can pick out elements of the page using CSS selectors, 
which I'll describe later. Uh, so so that the work of finding the particular parts of the page you're interested in is actually made quite easy uh, using CSS selectors. We'll see that later. Okay. But this code, um, let's see. Yeah, this code here is pretty straightforward. I'm going to show you it. It's 51 lines of code as shown here. Um, yeah, so it, it, it gets the URL. Actually, this works for any department. So the it, department's a parameter of this function. In this case, it's defaulting to computer science. It also can be run on like industrial engineering. And it passes that URL to this requests get function, and that returns the page. And beautiful soup is um, loads that page into, into this in, to create this uh, object called index. And then the code down here basically somehow uses that index object that beautiful soup created to pick out all the different parts of the index that we want. And then once we have the, the index information, we can then download the course detail page that we found. So in other words, uh, like once once we once we as we're parsing this index, we get the URL for each one of these, and then inside of a loop, what, as we we spin off and, and download the details and parse that one. And when we're done with that, we go back to the we go to the next item, and then and so on. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, th the the things you see in green here, the most of the things you see in green, um, are CSS selectors, which are used to identify pieces of an HTML document. And so the way that the numbers of the sorry the way that the rows are found in this uh, in the index page is with this selector course list space tr. Uh, we'll have a few slides later that explain how these are built. Uh, and then once we, and then inside that, there are these other selectors, the like TD colon nth of type one. This gets the first uh, TD element within the row, and then the second TD element within the row. And um, then it looks for, use this other selector A gets the anchor, and inside that gets the href thing, which is where you get the URL. But basically what, what I'm doing to, to build this, what I had to do was uh, visit the website that I want to scrape. So in this case, here it is. This is the computer science web page. And I have, to, I have to somehow look at the source code to figure out what the structure is and how to use that structure to find the elements I want. So I can right click it and click inspect. And this brings up uh, the source code, the HTML code that goes along with what I'm looking at. So as, and as I move through the HTML document, it highlights in, in Chrome or whatever browser you're using the element that corresponds to it. So like in here, I see, for example, like when I scroll over TR, I see, and if you like Google what, what you know, what TR HTML, it'll tell you that stands for table row. So this, this uh, HTML element, and this is XML actually, HTML is a type of, of XML and we saw that in class. Anyway, this, this element here corresponds to the whole row. And within that, there's like the first column, the second column, Within the second column, there's a link, and then within the link, there's a the title of the class. So basically, I, I, what I, I know that I need to find, I need to somehow identify all the elements like this, and get out the URLs and get out the titles, and do that for each each one of the rows, and also in the first column, do a similar thing to get out the uh, title of the class, which is stored here. Okay. And I need to I need to write CSS selectors that pick out the these uh, these elements. So how, I'm just going to show you a few examples here before going into the, the details. Like, uh, sorry, in the code on line 14 here, I use this selector that says hash course list space tr. All right. So what the heck does that mean? Well, hash course list in a CSS selector means find the element whose ID is course list. And then space something else means within that, now look for something that, is, that matches TR. So hash course uh, list is um, this thing here. See how over here, 
this element has ID course list. So that's the table. And if, if you, um, you see this whole table corresponds to this table element, which has the ID course list. So I know that what I want is inside this course list element. And furthermore, I said, I said TR. I had, I had hash course list space TR. The TR is this, um, the first one I find is this row. And actually, there are a sequence of TRs, right? So here's one, here's another one. So that every, every row corresponds to a different TR. So this, that first selector that I've highlighted here on line 14 picks, finds all those rows. And then I have a for, uh, loop that goes through the, the rows and does further queries to like narrow down to the specific elements I want using different selectors. OK, question, yep. Uh, what's the meaning of select, or what is that dot index dot select? So, index was the object returned by beautiful soup. I, I called it index. So beautiful soup parsed that what was so I, I downloaded the page here. So I believe this is like this is some kind of object returned by request, and and that dot when I call dot content on that object, I get the string for the HTML and passing that HTML code into beautiful soup and, and giving it, telling it to do an HTML parse produces this object index. And that's what I use throughout. And, and the select is a function provided by beautiful soup on these beautiful soup objects that does a CSS select selector on it. Okay. So, I mean, to, to, to I mean, to build this code, you really have, you have to read the documentation for the, um, the library I'm using, but also you can just look at examples. And this is a good example to use. You can actually, excuse me, you could copy and paste this to uh, probably build a scraper for another website without too much trouble if you um, just change uh, the selectors being used, change the URLs, change what you're looping, when you're, when you're looping, when you're not looping, and so forth. Okay, how many of you know, know Python? Okay. <laughs> so not a huge number. Um, <laughs> but that shouldn't matter too much because, uh, well, anyway, th th this code is, um, yeah, Python is similar to a lot of other languages. All right. Um, notice down here on line 31 that I call beautiful soup again on a different URL. I actually combine the request, like I combine sort of like these three lines from line eight to 11 into one line to do the, uh, do a request that gets a different URL. This is to get the detail page. Then within the, <laughs> excuse me, within the detail page, I'm doing something different to get the prereqs and the, the descriptions. Uh, and here there's a little bit of a, uh, logic because the formatting of the detail pages is different sometimes. So I like try one thing. If that fails, I try another uh, to deal with the uh, prereqs and descriptions. But uh, you can study this uh, later uh, if you're starting your own uh, scraping project. Excuse me. So I'm kind of sick today. Okay, so um, that, and I can actually run that code. Oh, this is the, the payoff here. <laughs> I can run this in PyCharm and it, uh, it's actually downloading all those, it's doing the scraping and printing out information about all the CS classes. And then eventually it's gonna switch to industrial engineering and print those out as well. Uh, there are more CS classes. So yeah, these are the, the IEMS classes and yeah. So I decided to print them to the screen, but I could have just as easily. Uh, so you, you see how it's like printing out the titles and then a link and then a prereqs and a description. This one, I guess, had no prereqs. Uh, so instead of just printing to the screen, I could have saved this to like a Python object and then did an analysis, or I could have generated some SQL code programmatically that added these as rows into a database 
so I'd have a permanent store of, of this data that I could do all kinds of queries on uh, later, right? And you could, you know, you could, you could change this code to scrape different departments by just uh, calling that function with different uh, different names of departments. So that's pretty neat, right? <laughs> all right. So another example that's slightly more complicated. Oh, well, something I did for my own personal amusement. Uh, the U U.S. Master Swimming swim team statistics. So U.S. Master Swimming is like a swim team for adults, uh, competitive swim teams. Uh, and uh, I do this, and I wanted to know. So they have this. There's this website that shows uh, meet results. So the U.S. Master Swimming shows like you can find people and it's like see like what their times were at different meets and stuff but there wasn't a way for me to answer the question i wanted to know who on my team i should be trying to beat next like who is faster than me who is slower than me who do i want to make sure stays slower than me <laughs> who do i want to make sure who do i want to try to get a little faster by who can i learn from and 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 who should i be trying to beat right and there was no way with this website to see that information directly because it wasn't organized at all according to teams um it just you had to like find people individually to see their results, and you couldn't. But and separately they had a list. Actually, they had a way to get a CSV file for the roster of your team, and that that was like this thing here. Um, so like they provided the CSV file for all the people on my team or any team, but then you you wanted to, I wanted to really cross reference this with those pages like I showed you that showed the results for those people and then I wanted to split them up according to events so like for example the 200 IM is a individual medley it's where you like swim four different strokes over 200 yards I want so if I so I know my time is kind of in the middle here uh which is kind of <laughs> which is not great because uh I'm I'm younger than a lot of these people you see the ages here or I was at the time and also, uh, you know, I'm male instead of female, so I should be going a little faster than a lot of these people. But anyway, so I'm a mediocre swimmer. But <laughs> in the middle of this list, um, so I know that, like, Nichelle is slightly faster than me. I, I should be trying to beat her. Then I can try to beat Bill and Ruby. Um, but I wouldn't be able to find – it would be difficult for me to find this information on the website itself. So, so I built the scraper to do that, and this, this code does this for all the different events and it's useful for me and then i can also give it to you know the coach so the coach can build relay teams and stuff like that putting people who are at roughly the same speed together um and but the code for this which you can look at um uh, here is slightly different because i wrote this a while ago and so i um i used a different style um this is using a different set of libraries so it's using lxml instead of beautiful soup and so this is doing an xml parsing to find nodes. It uses XPath to find uh, nodes using like different types of strings. And uh, this page also has, so th these are examples of X XPath queries. So this is a kind of the equivalent of those CSS uh, queries, but it, it has a different syntax for it. So I, I'm like saying like find an element ca called strong that's underneath an element called TD and whatever. And and this this page also has a lot of more inconsistency to it. So it requires a lot of logic to like for example, that some race times are listed as DQ for disqualified or DNF for did not finish. Have to find those. Sometimes uh race times are are in bold. Um Sorry. Uh Anyway, there's a lot of there's so it's like sometimes these are links, sometimes they aren't. So there's, there's more inconsistency in how the data is presented, so there's more logic required to scrape it and like get reasonable results out of it. That makes sense? Okay. Any questions about that? So I'm not going to show the code for this, I mean, in, in, in any detail, but it's available there to, 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 for your reference. Okay. And to run this took a little bit longer because it had to get detail pages for each of like maybe 50 people on the, t on the team. So this takes about f three or four minutes to run. Okay. Uh, so a different web scraping project that I was involved in uh, that I did, which was a lot more complicated, was um, for an analysis of uh, the research impact of the top 10 US business schools. This was done for Kellogg. 
They wanted to see how they compared with like you know Harvard and Stanford and Chicago and, and whatnot. And so this required getting a list of faculty members, getting a list of papers for all the faculty, and getting other biographical information about the faculty members. And there are like about a thousand different people in this across these top ten business schools who who work there uh, as professors. So it was, it was way too much to do manually. So I wrote some code over a couple of weeks to do this. And just to give you an idea of, of why this is a challenge, each of the each of the schools has a totally different format for for presenting their faculty. So here's Kellogg, right? And so he, here's uh, the detail page for someone at Kellogg. All right, so somehow what I want to find is like uh, the courses they've taught and their CV here. Anyway, and then here's, that, that was Kellogg, so what about Harvard? So Harvard lists their people like this. So it's a totally different index page. And then the details are also totally different, right? So there are like 10 different variations of indexes and detail pages. And there also is a lot of variations. So some people have publications listed, some of them don't, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, that project had a lot more code to deal with all the special cases. But uh, but it eventually actually worked pretty successfully. And I also wanted to, interestingly, sc scrape the Google search. Google Scholar is a sort of search engine for academics to, to list papers that they've published and see who's cited by whom. And uh, this is something that they, they actually, <laughs> they didn't want me to scrape. So here, maybe I do as I say, not as I do in, in this case. So I ended up scraping Google Scholar uh, to get a more accurate list of publications by the different faculty members. So basically I would do a search and I got the names from those index pages and then I would, I would programmatically do a search for like let's say Sally Blount who used to be the dean at Kellogg and it would give back a page like this and I would programmatically click this and then I would go through all these and click them to get the, the, the uh, details here and then and go through them. The problem that would happen is that uh, Google has put in some measures to make it quite difficult to scrape their results. Even though this is kind of like a, this whole Google Scholar thing is um, not really something they make money off of. But anyway, they still have some measures to protect you from scraping. So one of those measures is that periodically they'll give you a CAPTCHA like this. I'm sure you've seen these. Um, they, they used to be different where they had you type in a word. But nowadays, often there, there are these computer vision problems where they want you to select all the squares with street signs. So you're supposed to look at this and click here and here, and it lets you proceed. Uh, the reason why they present this type of problem is because it's difficult for a computer to solve this. So they want to give you a problem that only a human can do, therefore a scraper can't do it, right? So, and there also, is, it's, it, these, these pages are pretty complex. There's a lot of JavaScript and stuff and pop-ups that make it difficult for a program to just download an HTML file and interpret it and, and, and just download a sequence of HTML files. So the scraper for this um, used a tool called Selenium to actually control Firefox. So there was actually a browser window open and it would just control that browser window by clicking around. And eventually on the browser it would show, you, you'd see one of these things pop up and it would just stop and I would have to babysit the program and basically wait until it showed, what, and the program would detect that it was visible and stop trying to do anything. And then I would see it and then click through it and then it would keep going. So it would eventually get through the CAPTCHAs by, um, I, would, I would solve the CAPTCHAs manually while letting the scraping happen programmatically. Yeah. Anyway. All right, so uh, to give you an overview of, of web scraping, just the general steps, um, the first step is to find pages that hold the data you want. Uh, download the HTML and, and try to figure out how what parts you need to pick out and store. Um, whenever you see a web page, you can always look at the HTML code to figure out how the data is encoded in that page. And then uh, you need to write a program that downloads the HTML, starting with some original page and then uses either CSS selectors or XPath queries to find the specific part of the HTML where the data you want resides. 
Okay. Um, talk a little bit more about CSS selectors. Um, I mean, the best if you're really going to use these, then you probably need to just do some Google searching and and some tutorials, look at some examples. But so these are actually used. The reason why CSS selectors are really useful for picking out parts of HTML is that that's what they're designed for. They're designed for applying styles to different parts of the HTML programmatically. So um, uh, you can have a tag type like A as a CSS selector refers to all the uh, XML elements that have the the A uh, t type at the beginning. You can use class names like dot something, and this refers to something that has class equals something. And I already showed the hash something was an ID, so if it says ID some equals something, you can find that. You also can find attribute values uh, like this. You can combine things by putting like a space between two different uh, CSS selectors. It does the first query and then searches within it for uh, descendants. You can look for direct children with this uh, caret symbol or um, right brace. So this looks for a TD that's directly under a TR. You can look for siblings. Um, yeah, lots of stuff. But the documentation's online. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, is there any like, kind of overarching uh, explanation that you can use to slide? Like, okay, yeah, sorry. The aim of these two slides for is 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 to define CSS selectors, and again, CSS selectors are are used to pick out uh, elements of an HTML document. An HTML document is, uh, I believe, we had one. Um, so it's like the underlying code for a web page is HTML, and if you want to pick out, like, you, I know that there's some data here. This text comp sci 101. I, so I, as a person, I can see it and copy it and paste it. But if I want to write a program that can look at an arbitrary page of this format, like for example, for any department in the school, and it goes through every one of these rows, so if I want to do that programmatically, I want to be able to uh, write a pattern that picks out all the all the places where this kind of information is stored. Right. So I see where it's. I look where it's stored once, and then I look for like what are the things in this structure that you, that can uniquely identify this location. And this particular case, and there's, it's not going to be necessarily just one pattern that matches, but that you can you have a, you usually have a choice of patterns. But in this case, like I know it's inside of this tag that ha that's an A. Right? And like every time this uh, a course code appears, it's inside of one of these A things. So I can use that in my pattern. And, but it's not, not every A is a course code, though. Because like this um, description here, is also inside of one of these A things. So an A is a link in HTML. Just um, so, but not every. So in other words, not every link is a contains a course code. So instead, I want to look for links that are also inside of a row. That's a column that's inside of a row, but it's like the first row in that column. So I need. So if that's a rule that a plot that defines all of the course code locations, then I can translate that into CSS. And that that defines that. So specifically, just as an example, um, like this this CSS code here looks for a TD, which is a table uh, column. That's the first column. And this was done within an, an, a, another query that looks for all of the rows that were within something called course list. So it's like you combine those two things to find pieces of the HTML. So it's a way. So these CSS selectors are a way to, way to navigate HTML code, okay. basically. Yeah, these are like. It's just trying to show you in way too little space how to build uh, CSS selectors. So maybe it would have been better to to just. Um, Explain what they are. There, there might be examples, not a complete documentation of the syntax. But like, so like for example, here I have some. If I had this HTML code, and I want to pick out the A and the B, this pattern does it because it looks for a table, and then within that it looks for descendants that are TDs. So like we have a table. Uh, sorry, this should be a slash here before the table. So the table starts, the table ends, 
then within that there's a t whenever there's a td what's inside that is what i want that's the a and the b um yeah and there, there are tools for you that you can use to test these things out on pages so that you're not guessing. Like you can write a selector in Chrome and have it show you what it corresponds to. Yeah. In the CSS selector, is it primarily like not using some text or is it just Anything. Um, well, they, they, they pick out HTML, to be precise. They always pick out HTML. It's like, yeah. what part of the HTML do I want? And then what that HTML means depends on what it is. It could be HTML for an image, could be HTML for a link, could be HTML for just like some text that's inside of something else. Uh, and in this, for scraping, often you want text. You often also want links, because those links are useful for like finding supplemental information. Could also be that you want to download files. So um, like if you want to download all the images on a page, that could be a scraping project. And in that case, you wouldn't be looking for like text. You'd be looking for, for image tags and, and par picking out the URLs of the images. Okay, but yeah, thanks for the question. I think probably a lot of people had that question. Okay, so, uh, so you can use these examples, especially come back to the first one I showed you for parsing um, web pages. And then also, if, you know, if Python's not your thing and you still want to do some scraping, y you don't need my example to learn how to do it. Just Google you know, R web scraping or you know, whatever language it is that you, you like to use, and you'll find some examples and you'll see the same concepts ta talked about that I mentioned here, and you should be able to connect the dots to do that. So for, if you want to do some scraping for the project, don't feel um, you know, intimidated by this, you know, if you didn't follow this exactly, but understand these are the, these are the concepts, and um, you can also come to office hours to get through some of that stuff. Okay. So we talked today about, the, the in this first half, so there are two halves to this lecture. Okay, so in the first half we talked about uh, scraping data from web pages, writing so that you're, you're basically writing code that downloads an HTML page, which is a big text document, and then you use CSS selectors, maybe XPath, but usually CSS selectors to pick out pieces of the HTML that have the data you want, and you kind of repeat the process because often what you'll do is pick out links that allow you to download additional HTML pages to have more data. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's take a 30 second break and then we'll continue. Okay, let's continue. Second half is on uh, messy data, how to deal with messy data. And this is kind of a, a collection of different tools. There's no one solution, unfortunately. But So why is data messy anyway? Uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, it could be that some of the data is entered manually, like typed in by people, and they're just typographic errors, spelling errors. It could be that... Uh, because it's entered by people, they have different conventions for how to name things. Like some people might say Sheridan Road, R-O-A-D. Others might say Sheridan Road, R-D, period. Um, that's not really a data entry error, but it's a inconsistency because there wasn't like a strict uh, computerized uh, standard. Could be that you're getting data from two different sources, and those different sources have different naming conventions. So, so you'll see a pattern that these things often arise for names of, of uh, entities. Um, it could be that you have a computer program that has some bugs and it produces bad results. Like, for example, if you're 
parsing through data or you're, you're generating data and there's some data point missing for one of the columns or something, some attribute of the data and your program doesn't handle that well, it might just not output anything even though there was data. Uh, it could be that you're working with numbers and the numbers overflow, like you do some math and there, you, like maybe a divide by zero and that gives you not a number result in your program and suddenly now you have this like NAN thing in this where you're expecting a number and said you have some kind of error code basically. Or you, you, your number gets too big and it wraps around to, to, from positive to negative. Um, we'll see how that can happen uh, in a later lecture on number representations. It could be if you're getting data from a sensor, there could be a malfunction, temporarily leads to bogus measurement. It's not, I mean, I'm not sure if that's bad data per se, if it was actually provided by the instrument, but uh, maybe you still wanna detect those anomalies and deal with them. It could be that data was entered in different units. I've seen this definitely, uh, like it, it, for some, you could have information about companies and sometimes it's, it's shown as dollars and sometimes it's shown as millions of dollars. And to a human, if that's the only difference to a human, maybe it would be obvious that if you're showing revenue for Apple and the, you know, Apple Corporation and the, the, the number is like 1543, that means $1.5 billion, you know, that, that should be obvious to an analyst looking at it and versus if it's like some small company and it's one five point one five three, then maybe it's $1,500. Um, but uh, those things that are obvious to a person lead to data entry errors uh, in a computer that's, that's reading the data, right? It could be that da data is entered sometimes as a fraction, sometimes as a percent, so there's a difference of one, 100. It could be that data import was interrupted and so there's some missing data. And it could also be that data is scanned from paper forms uh, that, that leads to some errors in, um, in automatically reading those uh, numbers and letters and whatnot. Okay. So those are, just, those are just examples. I think there are probably other examples you can think of where data um, can be messy. So to start this off, let's look, with the, uh, let's look at some of the messiest, <laughs> messiest data you can find, which is OCR data. So OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. This is the technology that uh, you know, computers use to read t images of text. So if you scan a document like an old, uh, this is an old uh, book or something that has some text. You have a picture of the text and somehow the computer translates it into text. So it, it, it figures out what characters are in there and turns into a text document so that you can search for different words and, and whatnot and, and read it, right? So for example, Adobe Acrobat Pro has this built in. So if you have a PDF document that was scanned on like a, one of those copy machines, and open it in, a, in Acrobat, you can actually do a text search like for different words and it'll find them even though there are no real, there are no words in the document. The document is a series of, of images, yet somehow it has this technology that detects the words and um, lets you, you know, even copy and paste out of an image somehow, right? That's pretty cool. Um, there's also open source implementations of this stuff like Python Tesseract is a library you can use that does OCR and images if you have, if you happen to be doing a project where you have a lot of scans of documents and somehow you can't use an, a, another tool to do it um, that's a library you can use. All right, so generally with these tech, these, this OCR technology, um, text is pretty easy to recognize, like um, the Y-O-R-K-S-H-I-R-E. This, like, text is pretty easy. Um, you might have confusion between numbers and letters, like one and uh, lowercase l look almost the same in a scan. So that could be that could be mistaken. Usually, you, you'd use the context to figure it out. Like here, where it says fifteen thirty-eight, you probably would not. The software would probably not make an error of making that an L. But if if there's some cases where actually you do have a combination of letters and numbers in the same like word, that would be very confusing to the program interpreting it, and it could make an error of like you know zero to O and things like that. Um, punctuation is also really difficult. Like the difference between a comma and a period is very small on a, on a, in an image. So that could easily be mistaken. And you can also do OCR for handwriting. It's less accurate. Uh, so if you're doing OCR on handwriting, um, you, you would expect more errors. Okay. So here, here's an example of a uh, handwritten form. So this is something you might re really do an analysis on. For example, uh, these are uh, Indian health records, I believe or in insurance applications. I also, uh, on another project, was doing a, uh, helping someone who's doing an analysis on 
on handwritten uh, health records from India. But regardless of the country, um, even in the U.S., um, a lot of records, uh, if you go back in, in time especially, are handwritten. And you know, sometimes the, the form has these, these nice like grid, this nice grid on it to help the uh, user be more clear in writing and to help the program ha have an easier time of recognizing letters. But even so, uh, there will be errors in, in detecting this stuff. Right? Uh, the errors often occur in the checkboxes. So if you check something, a lot of times the, the mark will stray into a neighboring one and that'll confuse the uh, OCR. So if you're given a data set, it really helps to know like where it came from. Did it come from an o OCRing a bunch of documents? And if it did, then you should expect to see a lot of errors and somehow deal with that or know that your analysis is going to have a little bit of error in it because some of the values are going to be not quite right. Okay. So you can do some of this data cleaning in uh, ETL tools. I mentioned these before, um, extract, transform, and load. These are programs that are designed from to, to transfer data from, data from one format to another, for example, from files to databases or databases to databases. And these tools often have the ability for you to enter validation rules. So for example, you can check to see whether values are above certain expected range or below a certain range or if they're missing. And you can write rules to correct or discard problematic data. Um, so this is this is in this is available in specialized ETL tools. For example, Microsoft SQL uh, Server Integration Services. You can also write your own ETL tools in like Python or, or whatever. And Pandas also has this stuff. Um, so, but the bigger question, the more fundamental question, is how do you recognize bad data, not just how do you deal with it when you see it. Um, an important thing is to like. Uh, know what to expect. So if you're getting data from a source, the more documentation they can give you about what the columns mean and what possible values uh, are stored there and how to interpret the different values is quite useful. It's also helpful when you're importing data to, um, to no look at error messages and whatnot. Like, so for example, if you're importing into a SQL table, if you have been pretty strict in defining your schema, that can help you to detect problems. Like if you have, if you expect to see integers in a certain column, you should make the type of that column integer in, instead of text. That way, if you do have a text value that you try to store in that value in that column, you actually see an error message rather than just allowing it to be stored, in allowing some bogus value to be stored that you don't expect. If you if you expect all the columns to be there and not be missing, then you should make the uh, that column not null in your schema. So that again, if you find a row that's missing that value, it act the the import will actually tell you, will show an error message, and then you can say, oh, something weird is going on here. There was a column value missing when I didn't expect it. Therefore, let me look at the data to figure out what's going on. You know, so part of the solution to dealing with messy data is actually uh, setting things up so that you're aware when there is data that you don't expect, and not just doing an import that will seem to succeed, but then actually have some weird problems that you find out later. You might find out later, or you might even never, never learn, which is even worse. Um, another, another thing you can do to sanity check your imports is to look at summary statistics. Like after you load data into a table, you can look at the minimum and maximum values, the average values of columns, especially those minimums and maximums, t to see whether they make sense. If there are weird outliers, like if you've just imported uh, location data and the latitude and longitude you find is like not even a valid value for the planet Earth, like then there's, there's a problem. Uh, or if the location is not in Chicago and you thought you were looking at Chicago data, um, that looking at the minimum and maximum of those coordinates would help you to figure that out. Um, so that, that's available in SQL. If you're using R, you can, in a data frame, you can look at the summary. Uh, you can use, use a summary command to look at a summary statistics and uh, so on. Okay. So like I said before, um, you can try to use a strict schema to prevent bad data from being imported. But once, once you do that and you see that the data fails to import, you have to have some approach to dealing with that. Right? So what you can do is create a, a temporary text table that doesn't have any constraints. So basically import the data as it appears in that file, that CSV file, and then run queries on that to figure out, to find the weird data. Um, and then and deal with that appropriately, and then eventually import, export from the uh, temporary table into the final version of the table, and hopefully 
eventually, after you do some corrections in the raw data, eventually you'll, you'll be able to store it in the final format that has all the uh, has a strict definition for the columns and uh, constraints and whatnot. So, for example, requiring that nothing is null, and I'm sorry, requiring nothing is null, and that the names are a certain size and, and whatnot, and that the social security number is an integer. Although you might want this to be a, a text instead of an integer now that I think about it. <sighs> okay. But like I said at the beginning, one of the big problems with, uh, with messy data is uh, what's called named entity matching. So this is when you have objects that have slightly different variations of their names. So um, this could be people, products, companies, whatever locations. So if you have like Eleanor Roosevelt could be s indicated like that or could be E. Roosevelt, Roosevelt comma Eleanor, Mrs. Roosevelt. Those are all different variations of someone's name which really mean the same person. Although maybe the last one's ambiguous because there could be many. Oh, well. Same thing for Northwestern or different ways of, of, in, of writing Northwestern. If for a product you could have even more variations especially if you include like product codes and you know some descriptions of the product might have some weird details. But these all refer to the same entity, and somehow, if you're, uh, you're doing some kind of analysis on this, you want to treat those as the same, even though the text is different, right? So somehow you want to, you want to do uh, when you're joining uh, these data records, you don't necessarily want to do an exact text join, but somehow to, some kind of fuzzy matching when you're joining to allow some variation, but um, only the kind of variations that are appropriate f that you know still mean the same thing, you know. And this is something that people are good at doing, but it's difficult for computers to do this. Okay. So uh, one way we can do this, or so like one mechanism for doing a fuzzy match, is to create a synonym table. So if we're talking about SQL databases, uh, so this product synonym table is a list of all the different variations of names for products, for example, right? So here we have like five different variations of iPhone 6, the name iPhone 6S, that might be present in a, in a database. But these are all the same product ID, product 1. And another one, you know, Google Nexus, a different product that uh, has these variations, right? And that's product 2. So if we have that table somehow, somehow we build that table, then when we're doing joins between records that use different variations of the names, all we have to do is uh, do a join to this table to convert from the name we saw to the product ID, and then convert from the then join from that product ID to some variation of the name that's used in the other record. So instead of doing a, 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 a join of two tables, if those tables have different variations of the names, we can do a four-way join, joining the the product the first table with the synonym table, and then the synonym table with itself, based, and then joining that synonym table with the final table. The reason we join the two copies of the product table is to allow two different rows with the same product ID to be, to be uh, joined together. So it could be that uh, the first table uses this first variation of the name, so it would join to this row and then if the second table uses this last variation of the name, then this one could be joined with this one to join two rows in this table, and then this name would be matched with the third with the, the second table in the end. Okay. And so we turned a simple join into a more complex join with, with uh this intermediate table used twice in order to allow all those different variations to occur. Uh, and, but somehow, also, we had to build out this synonym table to make it work. Um, but at least if we did have that synonym table, we could make it work. Make sense? Okay. So um, this is not an ideal solution in the sense that creating that synonym table is not a solved problem. We either have to do it manually, which is slow if we have you know, a lot of products in that case, or we have to somehow try to do it automatically but it's not clear how we would automatically generate those synonyms. You could try to use machine learning, uh, and that's an, an approach that might work, but it's not. Uh, we need to, to think a little bit about that to, to figure out how to do it. So there are some tools out there. 
Like some data cleaning tools try to solve this particular problem uh, using some, some advanced uh, techniques. Because this named entity matching is probably the most common type of uh, messy data problem that people encounter. All right, so specifically, uh, Dedupio is a, pay, a service that you have to pay for, unfortunately, but it lets you, it, you provide it with a CSV file, and it basically, uh, you, and you train it, and it tells you, it eventually matches them up to get the same, uh, <laughs> it's dumb. Uh, there was some part of it I wanted to show, uh, yeah. So if you if you tell it the certain rows match, it, it basically keeps asking you, are these records the same? Are these records the same? And that trains a machine learning model to eventually uh, do uh, automatic recognition of uh, of different records. I think this is a better video that shows that actually. This is like the longer video. So the example. Sorry, hold on a second. So this is trying to recognize, uh, sorry, it's a little small. Um, th this example is uh, like early, it's some kind of facilities in Chicago, like maybe uh, early childhood education facilities in Chicago uh, or community centers or something. Yeah, no, yeah, early childhood locations, sorry. So this is a CSV file that has a list of a lot of early childhood locations. But these are the names are hand entered, so there can be some variations. So in this case, uh, the name is exactly the same, so that's easy. But there, that you could have variations that are different. Like this one here, for example, there are two entries where they have the same record ID. So actually, it turns out this is. That's a pretty good indicator they're the same, but also they have these names they are slightly different. Like this one has a period after South, and this one says ST period, this one, this one says street, and the description um, is slightly different. So what this the software is doing is it's asking the user whether these records are the same. So this is the training phase of the machine learning, and the user says yes or no, and it keeps doing that until, so here's another example that's a negative example. So these two are totally different. A person looking at this can see that it's totally different and they say no. And by answering enough of these questions that are, that are generated by the software, you, you train a machine learning model that can then go through all the data and hopefully with high accuracy uh, determine which entities are the same names. So basically I think what it's learning, in this process it's learning for example that this phone number uh, field is pretty important. Like if the phone number is totally different, it's probably not the right, the same place. Whereas um, the other one I showed you, the phone number listed was the same, but there was some variation in the address and site. So you, if, by answering yes to this question that these are the same, you're, you're telling the machine learning uh, uh, algorithm that the phone uh, field should be given pretty high weight and that certain, certain types of variations in the address and site name are permissible. In, uh, in matches. Okay. Another tool, uh, OpenRefine, this one's actually free. Basically, it does the same thing, but it, it doesn't have machine learning to do things automatically, but it kind of shows you the current status of like, uh, um, let me just have some good examples. So, here they're dealing with some company information and trying to match things up. And uh, it shows you, it sh in particular, it, sh it shows you all the different, all the different, different values that were in a certain column and how many times they appeared. And those numbers, the frequencies can help you to like combine different variations. Like if you look at these and you think that these, it turns out that these two here just have like spaces before, after them. And that's what makes them different. So you can apply rules that like do some string manipulation and you can also say like just click on these and say that actually these should be the same. So this is like a, a way for you to manually with some feedback from a tool uh, create those synonym tables in a way that's a lot more efficient than just like somehow typing them out. Right. Question about that? Yeah. 
All right. So the way that the first tool I showed you that does the machine learning, um, it's doing uh, some kind of uh, classification using the input that you give you that that, you, that you're giving it using the training that you're giving it. So the problem generally is that you, you have a list of names. And you might have a list of entities that you're trying to match them to, or you might not. And you have some training data that, that provides uh, some a mapping of a subset of these names to entities, the ones that you know to be, to be uh, correctly mapped. And then you want the algorithm to produce a mapping between all the names and the list of entities. So basically to label all of them for you. Um, Yeah, it's also possible that you could use a clustering machine learning approach where you have a lot of data, a lot of text data that has some variation among it, and you want the algorithm to somehow detect to detect what the different clusters of them are, like in terms of the variation among them. Um, like if, if there are a lot of strings that tend to be about the same, that's probably one label. But uh, yeah. But it's hard to know whether this is um, right because yeah, there's no training at all. Uh, with the training approach, it's more of a classification thing. So you have a particular uh, entity you're trying to match. Like, for example, you're trying to look for all the iPhone successes. And you have a certain list of known variations of the name that you've marked as being correct. And then you've, you have a, a larger set that you're not sure about whether they're six iPhone success or not. And then using the training you come up with some kind of rule which in this in this uh image for an svm is like the plane that splits the two different classes by split you know representing the uh the different words as points in some kind of space um and somehow you apply that to that that rule to all the unknown uh data to classify it as either being iphone success or not but this is this is like general machine learning stuff which is not, we don't have enough time to talk about it and um yeah so maybe it wasn't even worth uh, mentioning that. One thing that is uh, relevant and uh, pretty easy to understand is uh, these text similarity metrics. So if you if you have two different names or variations of a name, it, you you might imagine it can be pretty easy to use some kind of rule to figure out whether they're kind of close to each other. So and in text analysis, there's one that commonly used called the edit distance which is also called the uh, Levenstein distance. It's the, uh, it means the minimum number of single character changes needed to go from one phrase to another. So, for example, if you have iPhone 6S and iPhone 6-S, the edit distance is just one because to make tr transform one into the other, you have to do one edit of, of like one character. Just add the hyphen or remove the hyphen to go the other direction. Okay, so so the distance between these two strings is pretty small. There's only one edit needed to move between them. Whereas for these two words, school and college, the edit distance is larger. It's seven because to transform school into college, you have to, like, for example, remove the S, H, and O and add L, E, G, E. Uh, S, H, O leaves C, O, L, which is kind of close to college if you add the L, E, G, E. Um, Similarly, uh, distance between iPhone 5 and iPhone 6 is just one. So that, this is an example where text similarity is not totally reliable for determining whether two things are the same because in this case, changing th this one number leads to a different product and we, shouldn't, we wouldn't want to say those are the same product just because the string is close. Whereas in the earlier example, the hyphen was not important. Uh, so the distance there was pretty meaningful. Um, so this can be useful, but it's, it's not like a, it doesn't really solve the problem of, of, of named entity matching. It's just a helpful, uh, uh, something you can use within a larger tool chain for, for doing matching. Yeah. Another interesting approach to dealing with, with data that's messy or poorly labeled is crowdsourcing. Has anyone heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk? Anyone at all? Mechanical Turk? Okay. Yeah, one. So it's it's actually, it's pretty cool uh, and also kind of scary in other ways. But anyway, 
it's a it's a crowdsourcing marketplace. So basically, it's a way for you to pay someone a few cents to do something that'll take them a few seconds. So if you have a lot of small, repetitive tasks that require human intelligence, so you can't just write a computer program to do it for you. You have to have someone, someone, some person solve this problem. Mechanical Turk is, is a tool that helps you do that. So for example, if you have a bunch of images and you want someone to tell you whether or not there is a cat in the, in the photo, you could try to write a program to do that. Um, and some people, some programs might be able to do that with some accuracy. But you could also just ask a person to look at it. It would take them a second to answer the question yes or no, right? If you're willing to pay like a penny to get an answer to that question, Mechanical Turk is a marketplace that lets you get those answers, right? Um, so there are people whose job or part-time job or full-time job is just like hanging out on this website and answering little questions for people for like a few pennies at a time. So that's why it's like it's like interesting. It's also like kind of sad at the same time. <laughs> but uh, but this is useful for data analysis projects actually. So this is a use, really useful tool tool, tool to, for data scientists to know and for analysts to know. So for example, going back to uh, that problem of evaluating uh, the like publication records of business school professors, I wanted to know uh, what the year of graduation was for each of those professors to figure out like sort of like how old they were, or at least like how many years had they been working as a uh, researcher. So I had to, I wanted to pick out their year of graduation from their CVs. So the CV is like a, a resume for academics, right? So it's a PDF document that they post on the web, but this, these are like manually created. So they all have different formats. I couldn't really write a program to find that information automatically. And there were about a thousand or 2000 different documents to parse. So it would be kind of slow for me to do it myself manually. So instead, I use Mechanical Turk. So here's an example of a, a CV, you know, the first page. Uh, one of the professors at Kellogg, uh, you know, so she graduated with her PhD in 2016. This is the number I want, 2016. That's where it is on this page. Uh, but someone else's CV, uh, this uh, Torben guy, his CV looks totally different. And the number I want from his is uh, 1992, right? So for a person, this is a relatively easy problem. If you describe to them what you want, you give them like a little like one minute prep, uh, you know, instructions. But for a computer to do this is kind of hard because you have to like understand the comp the program has to understand the meaning of like space and indentation and bold and things like that. It's actually the way that we represent data in a document is actually kind of sophisticated. The way we re represent meaning in a document is kind of sophisticated. Like this is not a well solved problem. Uh, by state of the art artificial intelligence, and and even then, like you know, I'm not the start state of the art artificial intelligence programmer, so it was kind of easier for me to just like throw it at a bunch of people to to do, right? So I used Mechanical Turk, I downloaded all these PDFs, and I just like uploaded them to that tool, and like with a few clicks, I created a job. You know, I gave them a credit card number and told them I, I was willing to pay I don't know five cents for each one. And within a few hours, I had all my answers. Okay. So if you have a a um, sort of like document interpretation problem you want to solve to generate some data, this is a pretty useful tool. Okay. So here's another. So this is useful for parsing data in unstructured forms. So the the resume I was showing you was an unstructured form. Also useful for poorly scanned documents. Like here's a picture of an invoice, and figuring out what a person can f can get give you like the total on this invoice pretty easily, but it's harder for a computer to do that, especially if there's some variations and like handwritten an written annotations and whatnot. Um, photo identification I already said that, and transcribing audio is another thing. You can actually create t uh, tasks that involve listening and um, writing down like what what you heard. This is also useful when combined with automated approaches. Like if you if you if you know that you can use machine learning to solve the problem, but only if you have a few thousand or hundred thousand training data points, and you you want to generate that training data somehow, it's still you know it could be intractable for you to manually generate the training data. So you instead hire these these M Turkers, the crowd workers, to generate training data. So you give them some of the you give them some slice of the problem to do manually. And then you use their answers to train a system that can solve like a problem that's a hundred times bigger or something like that. That's the basic idea. Um, and you can you can use this even if you without doing any code. Um, so you, although of course like you guys all have some programming experience, 
But even without that, that programming experience, you can still use Mechanical Turk, um, although it's, you can do more complex things with their API to set up like, tasks that are dynamic and whatnot. Right. So <laughs> this is actually named after a fake chess playing robot from 1770, uh, which was called the Mechanical Turk because he like had this like supposedly Turkish outfit on or whatever. But <laughs> so uh, yeah, in the 1770s, automata were a big thing. So like machines that did things that, that like little like robotic machines. And this in this case, there was a this was supposed to be a robot that played chess. And it was exhibited around the world, and it kept beating people at chess. And like, I guess the idea was people believed at the time that there was actually a machine that had been built to play chess. Now, in fact, it hadn't been built. There was just a person inside of this. And you can see like, from different angles how the, this, this like, little chess master was inside this, this cabinet and had his arm up there. And could, I guess he could see the board. Maybe I think there might have been some magnets underneath the board that like showed him um, where the pieces were as they were moved around or something like that, or or maybe he could see through the the shirt. I'm not sure, but anyway, that's that's what the mechanical Turk was. And the same. So the reason why that that title is appropriate for this uh, service is that as a user, like you you just provide them with documents and somehow you get answers. It seems like magic. Like it's being done automatically, but it's not being done automatically. There are actually people who are who are doing these little tasks. Um, you just never meet the people. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we know that you have to be aware of, of some some uh, nuances here when, when using Mechanical Turk. So if you're giving someone uh, a task to solve, you can't be sure that they gave you the right answer. That's really the main thing. So, so in some cases, programs are more reliable than people, uh, but some problems are too difficult for computers, so you want people to do them, but then those people can be unreliable. So how do you solve that issue? How do you deal with reliability and, and trusting human input? Um, one thing you can do is there are like different rating systems to, to rate workers, and if you get bad results, you can sort of give someone a bad rating, and that might, you can only choose, you can tr try to re restrict yourself to just highly rated workers. Um, but another thing that's, that's useful is doing majority voting. So if you give the same task to three different people and two of them give you the same answer or three of them give you the same answer then those both indicate with pretty high confidence that you got the right answer but if you if you um yeah so you can you can give the same question to many people and then check that you got the same thing back and that gives you high confidence that uh that it's actually the true answer okay another thing you can do is manually check the results so sometimes it's actually easier to check the answer than generate it but that Depends on the, pro the problem. Like, for example, if you give out chess boards and you ask someone to, to give you a, a move that gives checkmate in three moves, it might be very hard to generate that, but it, would be, it could be easy to, to verify that's actually true. Although, I mean, that, I guess chess is an example where a program can verify it. But okay. So that, that was an example of um, crowdsourcing where you're, you're paying workers. Um, crowdsourcing is a term also used more commonly to refer to work that's not paid. An example of that is like Free the Files was a uh, project by ProPublica where they um, they had a bunch of political ad spending documents. I forget which, uh, this was maybe 2012 or 2008. Anyway, they're trying to figure out like who was buying campaign ads during one of the presidential elections. And uh, the forum, there was a data set available, which was a bunch of scanned invoices for television ads. But every television station had its own format for the invoices, and so they were sort of really hard to interpret. Uh, so similar to the CV thing I mentioned. Uh, so basically what they did was they, they created a website where thousands of like volunteers could just go on and look at these documents and tell the, answer a few simple questions like, what agency bought the ad, and how much did they spend, and what was the contract number? Uh, so same, it's it's another crowdsourcing example, except it was um, this was done by volunteers for free. Uh, yeah. People just answered for fun. Yeah, they answered for fun. They were like they felt like they were doing a service because this was like a political thing. Where like so, if you really felt that um, money in politics was a bad thing and you wanted to help this organization to say that like, you know, who was spending a lot of money and, and to, to like sway certain races and like maybe you'd be motivated to like fill in this information. But yeah. Like 
Yeah, yeah. So you, 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 right. So there's a potential for malicious users to, to give you wrong answers intentionally. And again, to deal with that, you can use some of the st same strategies I mentioned before. So with the mechanical Turk workers, often what you're worried about is them being just really lazy. And if they want to earn like all those nickels really fast, they can just give like whatever, like give random answers, right? The way that you deal with that and the way you deal with malicious answers potentially is to just give the same form to like five different people or three different people, depends on how much you can afford, and randomize who those people are. And if they all gave the same answer, then it's probably right. Like there's little chance, if someone's gonna make up data, there's little chance they're gonna make up the same thing as some other random person makes up. Um, yeah, so uh, I also run a, a gun violence data gathering website, which is sort of crowdsourced, um, which you can check out there. And there are a, uh, some additional resources here you can read up on uh, on your own time. So to, to recap that, uh, when you're dealing with messy data, when dealing with data in general, uh, you should know where it comes from to understand what kinds of errors you should expect. And in general, do expect errors. Don't expect everything to be perfect. Uh, check what's been imported to see whether you have weird outliers. And then there are a bunch of tools you can use to deal with it. Um, look at like generating synonym tables manually or using tools that let you like somehow more easily uh, match the synonyms together. And you also can use crowdsourcing for various things. But overall, I guess the message is don't blindly trust data that you're given, but scrutinize it in some way and then come up with a strategy to deal with it that's appropriate for the types of errors that you have.